It was a close run thing, but Bristol City are still in business. After a week in which the club came within two minutes of extinction, coach Bill Tovey pins up the team sheet. Moller, Stevens, Williams, Nichols, Hay, Newman, Bray, Musker, Economo, Harford, Chandler, Smith, M. Hardly household names, but they're entering soccer history as the younger side ever fielded in a football league fixture. It's a record City could well have done without. But with debts of one and a half million pounds, the club had to get rid of their eight most experienced and highly paid players. Their third division opponents, Fulham, are also in financial trouble. Some of their players will soon be out of work as well. Professional football has never had it so bad. The game is 60 million pounds in the red. This week, soccer chairman meet for crisis talks. A World in Action survey of the 92 league club shows that they're nearly all in debt, some to the tune of a million pounds or more. A majority will cut their wage bills and a dozen may go into liquidation this season. As the recession deepens, football is fast becoming a bankrupt game. I just say, it's just sick as a parrot. If I want to be entertained, I think I've got to play him. In the old days, it was down the line, your Stanley Matthews, your Tommy Finney, the ball came across. I mean, I'm probably talking a bit old fashioned now. And the ball came across the likes of Tommy Lawton, that loft house, and the thing was in the back of the net. And this is what I think the public would like to see brought back. It's not just um, one or two clubs that are rocking. Every club is rocking. Rocking very badly. Well, a lot of players are going to finish on the dole, uh, um, no matter what happens in the game. They've got to go, there are far too many. And, the, and the, the game cannot afford to upkeep them any longer. They've got to go. Money defeats you. Well, let's see what it's brought. And it's plain to anyone in the public. You don't have to be a genius. It's brought greed, indiscipline, uh, ill manners. But then I'll leave you with this lovely thought. Rich men don't sweat. And the basis of professional football, call it work rate, all the dress it up I like, is the fact you flog yourself to death and, and you sweat your guts out in the interest of the team every day of the week. But if you've got a whack of money, you see, you can go cushy. I'm very concerned the way the game uh, is organising its finances at the moment. And unless there's some serious rethinking done on a restructuring and re-rationalising of those finances, I'm afraid we may be faced with a, a contracting uh, industry. 30 years ago, football was a working class game whose supporters came out of the factories and the pits to stand on the terraces. Today, with fewer goals and more soccer hooligans around, people go shopping or watch the television. For every two spectators who used to watch football, there's now only one. Paradoxically, the entertainers they come to see are paid, in some cases, a hundred times as much as when grounds were full. The great little wizard has it again. A flick to centre finds Perry, who crashes it home into the Bolton net. Blackpool four, Bolton three. Back in the 50s, when Stanley Matthews was winning the cup for Blackpool, even the best players were on a maximum wage of £15 a week. Soccer slavery ended in 1961 when the players' union, led by a young Jimmy Hill, successfully campaigned for the abolition of the maximum wage. Within a year, Hill's Fulham teammate, Johnny Haynes, became Britain's first £100-a-week footballer. By then, attendances were dropping. England 3, Germany 2, the second period of extra time, and Hurst scored for the third time. England had won the World Cup. England's victory in the 1966 World Cup stilled any doubts about the game's long-term future. Footballers were now superstars, marketable commodities promoting everything from boots to breakfast cereals. As players' aspirations soared, so did their transfer value. In 1979, Nottingham Forest paid a million pounds for Trevor Francis and then sold him to Manchester City for an even higher fee. City's chairman, Peter Swales. I was one of the people that said it was great, smashing to have big transfer fees. You know, gets the excitement going, gets the adrenaline flowing amongst your supporters. But at the end of the day, it catches you up. And we've got, to call, we've got to call a halt to it now. Are you saying that people like Peter Swales are to blame for the state of the game today? Well, I've, I've got my fair share to answer for, certainly. Britain's highest prized footballer is Brian Robson. Manchester United paid £1,600,000 for him. 
His contract is believed to be worth £1,500 a week. Peter Swales explains how a top player's wages are made up. It's made up, basically, uh, obviously, of a good living, basic pay. They get signing on fees, they get loyalty bonuses, they get win bonuses, they get appearance money, they get to league position money. It's like Pythagoras is there in some of the contracts, actually. Oh, I, I worry every week whether we're working them out right, actually. It's that complicated. But they've, they've done what we all do, got as much as they can when they go in to negotiate. Jimmy Hill, the man who opened the door to free wage bargaining, is still sympathetic to the players' point of view. Now their employers are railroaded, press gang, you know, um, hypnotised, if you like, by their fans to take a risk so that the club can be successful and they can have one of those heady seasons where it ends up at Wembley. Now, they all take the risk and only two of them end up at Wembley. I mean, that, that really is the conundrum that, that, that destroys everybody at the end of the day. Jimmy Hill's successors in the Players' Union claimed another victory in 1978. They obtained freedom of contract allowing footballers to negotiate their own transfers when existing contracts expired. Once this freedom of movement started, we were frightened to death of a, of a player moving from, from one club to another. So we give them big wages, because we know that if we don't pay them, somebody else will. And we're frightened to say no to them. We're, we're petrified of saying no. If a star player comes into us and he asks for some money, extra, over and above, we're terrified it'll go somewhere else. And so at the end of the day, we agree to it. Even though you know that giving him the wage rise could put the club further into the red. Yes, that's gone on in the past. It won't happen here in the future. I mean, we, we, we shall tighten our belts considerably. We've reduced our staff over the last two or three weeks. And that's sad, really, because I, I, I don't like to see players going out of work. But it was here in Bristol that soccer learnt its lesson the hard way. As with most clubs, City had tried to buy success. The heart had ruled the head. What they'd achieved was a bank overdraft and a third division team on first division wages. Things had to be sorted out before the club went bust. Chris Barlow, a lean accountant with a clinical approach, was commissioned to do a financial survey. He discovered a trading disaster of bad decisions and unpaid debts. Owing one and a half million pounds, Bristol City could not even pay their income tax or VAT. Barlow said that the club's eight most highly paid players would have to tear up their contracts and leave, thereby saving City £290,000. The players were given 10 days to decide. Either they agreed to leave the club or the club left them by going bankrupt. The Ashton Gate eight were all on long-term contracts worth twenty to £25,000 a year. They'd played for City for many seasons. Their spokesman, Jeff Merrick, was understandably bitter. I think that in football, it's proved to me anyway that uh, loyalty is a complete and utter waste of time. I mean, loyalty, to me, has turned into a dirty word because we've just had it shown to us that they can turn around and say, well, we've made some terrible mistakes and uh, you can possibly get us out of it on your bike. The players were reluctant to volunteer for the dole queue. They wanted financial guarantees, which Bristol City couldn't give them. Negotiations broke down. On the day before the deadline expired, City's chairman, Archie Gooch, arrived at the ground to preside over a crisis board meeting. I think this is a, a very important meeting. It could well be the last but one meeting. The final meeting, would, of course, would be to call in the liquidators. The final offer to the players was two weeks' wages and a possible £58,000 from the proceeds of a new share issue. What we're saying to them is, look, for God's sake, take this. It's more than you'll get if you turn around and refuse. Go on, go on, Mike. 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 Meanwhile, at Bristol City's practice ground, the eight players were running out of time. Certainly be a fixed players on the door, there. Footballers juggle with a ball, not a balance sheet. And for an independent check on the club's financial situation, their union, the Professional Footballers Association, hired their own accountants to go through the books. What is the effect of getting 550,000? Minus the preferential creditors. Preferential 239. Having done their sums, the PFA accountants had to agree that Bristol City was insolvent. Welcome you all, who welcomes the right word. We've had a very hectic... PFA Secretary Gordon Taylor gave his union members the bad news. 
he advised them to settle with the club. That our prime objective has been to protect the position of the players, the position of the eight players on whom it's centering round, and the position of the remaining players. Taylor, secretary uh, of the initial cap professional uh, uh, footballers association. Next morning, the football world's attention focused on Bristol. The Ashton Gate Eight were the central characters in a soccer melodrama. They had to agree to go by midday or the club closed down. Sure. Finally, at two minutes to 12, the deal was clinched. Shortly before 12 noon today, uh, agreement has been reached with all parties. Bristol City was still alive. The eight players had made the final sacrifice. They were now redundant on the soccer scrap heap with commitments they could no longer honor. I've got a new car, <clears throat> but contrary to popular opinion, I didn't walk into the showroom and pay cash for it. I had it on uh, a bank loan the same as everyone else does. So that's something else that may have to go. I don't know about the other boys, but they... I've been asked by my bank manager this week to clarify my uh, financial position with him. Um, and I couldn't uh, sort of tell him one way or the other. Uh, we're still in the dark as to how much uh, we're going to be getting at the end of the day. Um, and I couldn't really tell him. The same as me, I've got to meet mine tomorrow. Yeah. Hope he's sympathetic. After what's happened here in Bristol, do you think footballers' contracts are worth much? No, I don't. I think that... Uh, if they can do this to us here at Ashton Gate, then anyone in the country, any professional footballer in the country, has a contract that can, if handled by a clever man, be rendered useless. Are footballers' contracts really worth the paper they're written on now? Very much so. Very much so. The club couldn't have, uh, have sacked those players without the players' permission, and the players' permission has only been given because of um, what's been negotiated for them. We are guaranteed nothing. We're guaranteed two weeks' wages, and that's all we're guaranteed, to leave the club, to save them. Have you felt the pressure? Yeah, I mean, the pressure's been absolutely incredible. Uh, we've had some nice things said about us. Um, one of the boys had a letter sent to him threatening his wife and kids. Um, if we don't get you, we get the kids. There was any cranks in there. There's been, there's been telephone calls. It's, it's a constant call with, with the press and the media. Plus, lots of supporters who feel that we are actually to blame for the situation and that we have to go. Mm -hmm. um, Without really knowing the facts, of, you know, the truth of the matter, right. really. According to Bristol sports writer Peter Godsiff, the truth of the matter is that management folly put the club's future at risk. It's a gambling world, football. People take chances. They take terrible risks in, in paying these vastly inflated transfer fees for players, uh, very high wages that, they, that the, the clubs just can't afford. The game can't afford this kind of outgoing. City's troubles began when they reached the first division in 1976. Thousands flocked to Ashton Gate to see the big-name teams. But like many before them, City struggled in the top flight and their ambitious players grew frustrated. Finally, in 1979, City's young centre-half Gary Collier took advantage of freedom of contract to desert the Bristol club. Uh, he went to Coventry behind the City's back uh, and this brought a reaction, a very prompt reaction from Alan Dix, the manager at the time. He decided that this was never going to happen again as far as he was concerned. Uh, he signed up several of his key players extraordinarily long contracts. The longest went to Clive Whitehead, a curly-haired left back who was already on 500 pounds a week. He was given an 11-year inflation-proof contract. I think that uh, to give a players a long contract uh, means that the incentive for playing has disappeared from their lives. In the case of Clive Whitehead's contract, 11 years, with built-in bonuses that he didn't have to earn, it was quite ridiculous. The manager who created these long contracts is no longer with Bristol City. Alan Dix was sacked two years ago. The 11-year contract was to keep six key players at Bristol City, but it always gave us the whip hand in being able to sell them when it suited the club, rather than the player walking out. Although City scored the odd goal, they were relegated in successive seasons and ended up playing teams like Newport County. But because of Dix's long-term contracts, directors Ted Kingston and Archie Gooch 
were forced to pay first division wages to third division players. The crowds dropped away. I mean, 18,000 first division, 10,000 second, 5,000 uh, at the present time. And that, that, I think, speaks for itself. So it was Alan Dix's fault? I think Alan Dix has, uh, has a great deal to answer for in, in that respect. I would blame the directors. I mean, they, they've, they sacked me on the pretense that it wasn't going right. And having done that, they should have then made the decision to get rid of the players who was costing the club all the money that they say it does. I don't think the outgoing board, Chairman Archie Gooch, his Vice Chairman Ted Kingston and the others, can be exonerated from blame because they have uh, authorised uh, heavy capital expenditure, particularly on players, during the last 12 months, when they must have realised, if they had any indication of the financial state of the club, that the club just couldn't afford to go into these commitments. These commitments were Swedish international goalkeeper Jan Muller, signed for £120,000, and centre-forward Mick Harford for £150,000. City still owe Harford's former club, Newcastle United, two-thirds of his transfer fee. But that debt didn't bother these men. They're the caretaker board for a new company calling itself Bristol City 1982 Limited. The club now had two boards of directors. This one trying to raise a million pounds by issuing shares, and the old one handling all the debts. This intricate plan had been devised by Chris Barlow, who'd been working day and night to keep the club in business. Can you explain to me why it's necessary to have a pair of Bristol cities? Well, in simple terms, um, Bristol City Football Club Limited, the old company, is, if you like, rotten to the core financially. There is no way, in my opinion, that um, a share issue could be successfully launched in that company to save it. Because pr prospective investors, whether football enthusiasts, local supporters, or institutional investors, could possibly take the risk of investing in a company where they might see most, if not all, of their money go straight to pay the debts. The concept of the new company is that the investors will be investing in a clean new company. Is this a way of fooling the creditors? Most certainly not. Most certainly not. Um, the creditors will all have to agree to all the arrangements. So this deal it depends on the creditors being prepared to accept a, a moratorium. But why should they agree to wait for their money? What's in it for them? Um, because if they don't agree to wait for their money, they're not going to get it anyway. So they might just as well wait and get something, as opposed to wait and get nothing. <laughs> Acting on the Barlow plan, new directors Ken Sage and Darren Collar were determined to run a tight ship. According to Ken Sage, too many club officials have been whining and dining their business contacts at the club's expense. Complimentary tickets had also been dished out by directors, and this too was out. We don't want anybody that's not prepared to pay their way in this club. A director on the old board, David Callow, explained why in the past complimentary tickets had been distributed. But, uh, it's almost a barter system. You get a company who possibly supplies you with nearly a thousand pounds worth of wood over a season for repairs and stuff. And quite often it's just a couple complimentary tickets which sees the bill satisfied. The football club is no different than a, a golf club where you, you go and you meet people and sometimes um, you can meet a businessman who you find you do deals with. But uh, unfortunately in other cases like myself there's a, a long way between mushroom farming and football. That is the old Bristol City Club and we're not responsible for the old Bristol City Club. I mean that is in the hands of the old directors and the auditors told me no. No one escaped the new board's economy measures. Even people like Ted Kingston and Archie Gooch had to pay for their Saturday afternoon's pleasure. We are, uh, we've got a pair to come in. Great. Oh, 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 it's ridiculous, isn't it? Oh, most certainly. Why, it's absolutely ridiculous. This is not the way to... Having sunk £200,000 of their own money in the club, the old board felt entitled to free seats. But those days were over. The Bristol Revolution was complete. And the astonishing fact was that it had been engineered by a man who knew nothing about football. How many football games have you been to, Mr. Barlow? Not very many. How many? Uh, one. <laughs> Why does it need a complete outsider like yourself, who isn't even interested in the game, to make football 
face up to its deficiencies? Well, maybe because um, people who are involved in something which they love uh, can't see the wood for the trees. 20, Blind faith or not, supporters are rallying to City's cause by contributing to an appeal fund organised by a local pub manager. One from Eric for it here. Um, we've had one from Luton Town. It's this one here. Four and a half year old boy. S 60 pence pocket money. Leslie Trot of St John's with Church. This is my pocket money to help save the city because one day I want to play for them. You know, four and a half years old. We love got... Leslie Trot. And then just another incident, I've got no letter from them, but the knock on the door on Sunday. Uh, pensioners hit the door with uh, 20 pounds. One City fan made a different contribution. On the day before the Fulham game, Terry Grady set off on a sponsored walk around the Ashton Gate pitch. Well, I've been a City supporter now, about 40 years. All I want to do is come down here and see me football Saturday afternoons. <laughs> Twenty-four hours and 80 miles later, Terry Grady had raised £850, just enough to cover the combined week's wages of three members of the first team. After his ovation, Terry walked outside to come back in as a paying customer. It was to be City's biggest gate of the season. 9,200 spectators turned up for the match and dug into their pockets for the appeal fund. Once the game began, the fans got behind their team. City's youngsters outplayed the league leaders, and although the game ended in a goalless draw, everyone was delighted. But the euphoria couldn't hide the fact that City's future still hung in the balance. The club has a stay of execution, but long-term survival depends on the success of the share issue. Many clubs are in equally dire straits. In World in Action survey of the 92 football league clubs, nine told us that they'll also take the drastic step of asking players to tear up their contracts and leave. Altogether, 51 clubs said they need to cut their wage bill. These are the sombre facts that confront the league club chairman when they meet this week. For the last month, they've been lobbied heavily by their own club officials who see the crisis threatening their jobs. The main demand is for players' salaries to be curbed even if it means reintroducing the maximum wage. Bournemouth director Alex Stock. I can see the days coming again when clubs will press for the other thing, maximum wages. Maximum wages appropriate to the league in which players play. I would like to see a, a system where the maximum, say, in the fourth division was £250 per week and up to, in the first division, 400 or at the most £500 per week. And they could earn a lot more if they're pulling the people through the turnstiles. Uh, Jimmy Hill is still opposed to maximum wages, but one of his solutions will certainly raise a few eyebrows. The TV soccer pundit actually blamed television for the game's economic decline. Um, we need to restrict the amount of television, I think. I think we need to ask the newspapers to stop using every resource uh, that they sometimes have at their disposal to knock the game and destroy it. And I honestly think, and I'm old-fashioned here, that we have dished up for the public, a game they neither understand nor want. And so I think we have to change. Change either the laws or the instructions to coaches and managers and players to make the game entertaining again. We cannot have this midfield jungle where we see 90 minutes mediocrity, where skill is stifled uh, and spectators are bored. Two years ago, with attendances falling and costs rising, league chairmen met but failed to solve the crisis in football. Now they've run out of time. To survive, they have to put the sport on sound business lines. Coventry City Chairman Jimmy Hill. How important is this three-day meeting of league club chairmen? Well, it's a uh, hundred times more important than the one that we held two years ago because um, trends have not gone for us, they've gone against us. The trend points to footballers on the dole, like Bristol City's Chris Garland, sacrificing their careers to keep clubs in business. Even watching my son play this morning, you know, it's, uh, it's a feeling that you know, you're knowing that you're not going to play this afternoon yourself. And you feel a bit sad, really, knowing that uh, you won't be out there playing again in a red shirt. Now they're in the groove, pretty soon they'll prove the finest in the land. We come on, combine our misters, by bus, by 
train and car And on every ground you will hear this sound As we shout, Ooh! 